So welcome everyone, this is Board Game Bonkers, I'm Jay Sears, and on today's guest we've got Ollie Steinis, who was the designer of Champions of Midgard. Welcome Ollie. Thank you very much, nice to be here. You too, thanks so much for coming on. Um, do you want to tell everyone just a little bit about yourself? Yeah, well, uh, like you said, I'm a board game designer, uh, and now I'm fortunate enough to be a full-time employed and self-employed. Uh, of course, I work uh, on contracts for, for publishers and uh, submit my games to them. Uh, before that, I was in the computer game industry as a regular uh, employee, um, designing uh, games and making level design and QA work uh, for several years. And then on the side, I made I made the board games, but now I, I've a couple of years ago, I, I le took the big leap and, and became a full-time board game designer. So that's what I'm doing now Fantastic. from my home in uh, Copenhagen, where I have uh, two kids and a dog to distract me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how, how's the weather over there at the moment? Oh, it's very nice, uh, thankfully. It's been a very dry uh, spring and, and early summer here, which is not usual, but uh, we'll expect rain at any time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bit, a bit like the UK, it's sunshine, and then yeah, next week it'll probably be all rain, letting that be in the verse that we're usually. Fantastic. I'll just explain to the viewers what this is all about, and I want to be clear, this is not a quest, this is a Q&A, and it has a few twists. Well, this is called The Meeple Lights, and that's the show within the Board Game Bonkers channel, and what we'll be doing is presenting to our guests 10 questions related to the board game industry, but there's a twist. Well, what's a twist? Well, first of all, our guest has no idea what the questions are, and that's because they'll be drawn from this bowl. And when we finish those 10 questions, we'll move them to the side. So future guests coming on will have 10 completely new, unique questions, so we can keep it fresh each time. So, will our guests thrive under the maple lights, or will they be a little bit nervous? Well, we're about to find out as we present 10 questions to our guests. Are we ready, Ollie? As ready as I can, I guess. <laughs> so we'll keep this in the form as we can, and I'll be drawing out the first question. Most of them are related to the board game industry, although we do have a few what I call fluffy questions. And if there are any particular questions you don't want to answer, we can skip and we'll draw another question. So it's no obligation to answer questions anyone's uncomfortable with. So we'll go ahead and draw out the first one. So let's see what we've got. Okay, Ollie. So the first question, what are your thoughts on the possibility of AI being used to create art for board game design? Oh, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, of course, as a, as all the creative people, it's, it's interesting and scary at the same time, right? Uh, I actually had a publisher ask me to do a pitch for a game, and then they also made a pitch, uh, have an AI do the pitch. It's probably chat, uh, CBT, or... Uh, GPT, um, and uh, but it, uh, so I th I think like many artists, I think it's a a great tool to aid. But at least for some time being, it needs a human touch to not be all gibberish or very generic or a knockoff or something that all that's already out there. It didn't come up with any interesting design, but it did came up come up with a design that sounded like a board game pitch. So I. I think it could be good for inspiration, at least for now, until it shoves us away and take over <laughs> the industry. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's something to watch for the future, certainly, because as as artificial intelligence progresses through the years, I think we will see that kind of tug and pull where I think there will be someone who takes that gamble to perhaps create some art design with AI because the concept and in terms of what comes out is stunning and it's quite realistic and very close to what you might pay an artist to design. And I suppose the risk is, and there is a caveat to this, that, you know, you have, you've got that argument that, you know, artists do charge quite a lot for some board game designs, uh, depending on the artist you go to. But there's also that caveat where if we start seeing AI introduced into the board game world, there is a risk of putting people out of business financially, and you know there is that risk of well, what do I do then if AI starts to take over my job? So there is a risk there, and but there is also positives as well, as, as you pointed out, isn't there? 
but it is yeah i'm, I'm an old guy uh, so uh, it, it's a bit scary of course too <laughs> to see why it goes I'm, I'm mostly concerned about the also the knowing or not knowing if there's been a human touch there because i think when you see the ai images some of them you want to know that there's been a, a, an inspiration a purpose a behind a story behind each painting right then that's the same with the board game um so uh i think it, it lacks soul when it's by uh, yeah design but of course if you don't know it and still thinks it's a brilliant work then uh, i guess it, it works but it is a bit scary and of course all the the whole uh infringement question right that's still unanswered and debated heftily yeah absolutely an old man first meeple uh did actually did a talk down on this uh discussing the use of ai the risks with it um potentially you know potentially putting people out of business um you know artists who may struggle to think work if ai is introduced um into game design but like i said it can be an inspiration um and certainly i've given it a try to see what it can do and some of the, the results are so realistic and it's you know some of the, the, the artwork is stunning it comes from it but that like you say it takes that human touch away and that soul that sits behind the the game design and that is you know can be quite sad for some people in the in the industry so we'll wait and see what direction it goes goes down so um what we'll do we'll move on to the next question and uh, i'm sure people will have uh their own thoughts and they can leave comments down below and let us know what they think about ai because it'll be interesting to see what other people's opinions are particularly those who actually design games as well and create art for games so we'll move on to the next question are we ready let's give this a yes mix here all right on to question two so is there anything in the board game industry that hasn't been done before that you would like to see? <laughs> well, I'm a designer, so if there was, I would probably try it myself, right? Um, something that hasn't been done, I would like to see. Hmm, that's a hard one. I think I'm still missing a board game that that's, uh, explores and succeeds in the horror genre, right? Without being a role-playing game, perhaps. Um, because I love i love the horror genre uh but i'm only being scared on computer games and and uh, and movies and books right not not the board game media yet uh, that could be interesting usually they end up being quite silly <laughs> uh, even if you try to take them seriously so maybe that maybe it could be a horror game i haven't figured out how to do it myself i have some ideas to add suspension to a game but but to me, a game where you actually sit at the edge of your seat when you play it, that could be cool. So. Yeah, there's, there's obviously quite a, I mean, you've got likes of Arkham Horror and all that, you know, the popular horror games out there. And yeah, it's a bit of tongue in cheek with them. But also, there was a, a board game that was designed, um, I can't actually remember the name of Paranormal like, um, Investigators, I can't actually uh, remember what it was, where you actually had to put lights, you turn the lights off, there's a lot of meeples that got lights on them. Oh, you know, yeah. They, and you're going around the balls, it creates that atmospheric uh, feeling. Um, you're in this dark room and you can only see from what the lights can show you on the board. So that was an interesting... Yeah, I haven't tried that. Maybe, maybe, maybe it actually does what I'm looking for. <laughs> that, that was an interesting take on a, on a horror. But yeah, the difference between watching a movie that's a horror is completely different to playing a board game. I, I suppose a lot of it is to do with people you play with as well as the atmosphere that's created in that room. So it'd be interesting to see if any, any designers, you know, try and look at different in different ways of creating that, that atmosphere in, in a horror ball game. So it'd be interesting to see what comes out in the future. Yeah, I was about to say, I think it's the lack of sound and music, et cetera, that, 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 that's the problem. But then again, uh, books can, can be uh, really scary. So they don't have the soundscape at all, right? So uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, so perhaps the, the story narrative element that takes someone through that journey. Yeah, so let's see what comes out in the future and see if we can get some uh, some different styles of horror games. Fantastic. So we'll move on to the next question. So number three. Okay. So here we go. Now, in case anyone's wondering, I haven't actually flushed any fish down the toilet, so it's completely simply but not <laughs> used for, for cocktails. And uh, yeah, I haven't had any use out of it yet. So number three. 
So what would it take for another company to beat your top choice in the board game industry? So if you've got a top choice in the board game industry in terms of a company you, you use or you go to a go-to company, what would another company have to do to top that choice? Uh, uh, as a recipient of my game design, you mean? You can certainly look it in that avenue, certainly, yeah. <sighs> Um, yeah, that, 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 that's a good question. Um, I mean, uh, I, as you probably know from my designs, if you, uh, you mentioned Champions of Midgard, but, but I really like, the, uh, I like midweight, very thematic games or, or lightweight, somebody would probably say. Um, and so, yeah, anybody that caters for that is my top choice. <laughs> and of course, if, if they can reach a, a huge audience, I guess that, that made it perfect um but i think i'm in a good position now i have some nice contacts uh some nice collaboration i don't know what would top top it i don't know free free chocolate with every thousand copies sold <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's um yeah you got a couple of big guns haven't you asked me be and uh, a couple of big big guns in the industry who are doing extremely well um you know Cool mini or not, etc. And yet you're right, it's about what fits into your style and the weight of the game. And you touched on a really important point. That relationship that you have with the publishers is really important. It's everything, yeah, yeah. Um I've met all kinds of publishers and uh, it's really different. Uh, and you really gotta hang on to the ones that, that you click with because uh, yeah, it's 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 not a given and it's certainly not only dependent on what kind of game or, or what quality of game you make. I mean, there's also a bit of luck and, and, and perseverance, I guess, when you shop around, basically. Uh, so, yeah. Absolutely. Fantastic. So we'll move on to the next one. So we're on number four. So let's uh, see what comes out. All right. So how do you organize what you do? Do you have a process or is it chaotic? <laughs> Well, I'd like to start by saying that my best designs are the ones that are made fastest, <laughs> that at least gets fastest from idea to initial prototype. So I guess that's a bit chaotic, but it usually comes through that when I have an idea and if I have a playable game fast that I like, then it's also gonna be published as, as one of my better games. But if I have to struggle and 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 tweak and not and and do all kinds of balancing for a long time, it's never gonna really really fly. I think. Um, but as a, for a structure for the process itself, well, it depends on who my my client is basically. Because sometimes they come to me with an IP, which I'm feeling very fortunate. Of course, uh, the big one I had, the first one was the Deep Rock Galactic. Uh, the, the computer game, uh, the board game adaptation. Um, and that's, of course, that's very interesting, but that, that gives you a lot of requirements from, from both your publisher and the IP owner. Um, and and then, then if, I came, if I come up with my own ideas, I have, I have a lot of freedom, but I also have to keep the discipline myself. Um, but I think it's 50% structure and 50% chaotic because like, I guess, like with a book author, I I let myself like maybe spend an entire day reading about uh, mythology for some weird civilization, even though that, that wasn't what I was supposed to do, but I really wanna research stuff for just one or two cards in my game. So I spent way too long doing it because it's fun and it's inspiring and it adds to the, the lore in the game. So uh, that's not structured. That wasn't planned when the day started, but uh, it, it adds quality to the game, I think, in the end. You know, if, even if the card is scrapped, then at least I learned, learned something more. Yeah. Which is kind of funny also, because as a board game designer, when you do thematic games, you end up being an expert in some very few, very specific weird areas, because you have to really study something uh, to make a good game, and then uh, everything else is just pushed aside. So that's fun. Yeah. Is there a point where you think, well, you know, I need to shelf that. That's, you know, it's it's not quite working. At what point did you say? Or 
is it a, a point when you're designing a game is it a point you think do you know what i'm making too many tweaks here i don't think it's quite working i need to shelf it for a while and leave it yes there it is and i usually discover it a bit too late <laughs> uh, it's better to kill your darlings early right uh, but i want to save them uh, so usually i work on for a couple of weeks extra and then i realize that uh, no it's not not gonna work um, but it's also hard like i said before with the the, the random nature of uh, publisher or, or finding the right the right publisher uh, you can't always rely on the, the feedback you get from your publisher. And this is also good advice, I think, to new designers. If if you present the game to one or two publishers and they reject it because of reason A, B, and C, that might not be true for the next publisher. Maybe they may like it. Of course, you should listen to the feedback, especially if you get the same feedback. Um, but, but publishers are really different, and they publish different types of games. Uh, so, uh, so, but that influences uh, my decision, of course, also when to scrap a game and when to continue. If they support me in the process, then I'll continue. But I also had publishers that wanted me to do changes to a game and I changed them and we couldn't really make it fly. And then later in the process, I discovered that it wasn't right to do that change in the first place. I shouldn't have listened to that publisher, basically. I should have taken it somewhere else. Um, so yeah, that's it. It's all, it, I guess it's all a, uh, Hard experience. Yeah, and it, you're right. It is an experience. I remember. Um, so I've designed a couple of games, and I've taken them to the playtesting group. Um, so it's part of the UK playtesting group. And you know, the feedback was oh, it was too tight. It needs to be a bit looser. You know, and they, okay, so I go back. So I was, I was mathematically working out every perfection in the game. So I went back and I listened to it. Then the next feedback was it's too loose. And I'm thinking you just told me it's too tight the last time. <laughs> And I spent hours, so it can it can backfire. You're absolutely right. You sometimes have to use that experience and what feels right, and that's why what I, what I found. Yeah, that, that's true. I've, I've had that more than once too. That it's like it's too complex or it's too simple, and you can go back and forth forever. I mean, until uh, uh, you land at some point where you're uh, you're happy with it, or, and a, a publisher is hopefully happy with it. I mean, for Champions and Midgard back then the worker placement with dice uh, that was quite original and i took it to the the essen spiel fair in germany and i presented it to some of the different publishers both german and american and they were, they were like either it's too euro or it's too ameritrash and then luckily when it hit gray fox after the fair actually um then they said it was a perfect blend because I was start, starting to doubt myself as well. Am I sitting between two chairs and I, am I hitting nobody? And luckily they saw the potential. Uh, so. Yeah, well, it certainly worked out well for you. So it's been quite a big hit that game, has not it? It's uh, been very successful. All right, we'll move on to our next question. Okay, I believe we're on five. Yes, we are. Whoa. Hey, so this there, this leads on quite nicely actually, and uh, I think we can partly answer it. We'll go with that. So, what do you wish someone had told you before you had started designing games? Sorry, I didn't get that. What did I what? What had you wished that someone had told you before you start designing games? Yeah, yeah, we talked about some some of it, right? With at least with the thing that no, not two publishers are, are the same. Um, so. It's not always on you. Um, um, I th I think for me personally, but I'm not probably not the only one, is to not limit yourself too much. Because my first designs, I committed to like one publisher for like, and they had the game for like six months or eight months, and then uh, decided they couldn't publish it or something else happened. Um, I think uh, uh, to 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 be a bit more cool and spread out and offer to more publishers. Uh, that would be something um, I would have liked to know. And I still struggle a bit with it <laughs> because I get uh, I get affected if a publisher is like all over the place. I had that last year actually where somebody was like, oh, we can already depict the stage for this on, on Essen Spiel and it's going to be awesome. And the CEO is happy. and. So you, you buy into it, uh, you believe it. I mean, 
I've had that more than one time where the boss himself from the company says, this is a perfect match. But of course, there are so many factors playing in. Uh, so maybe it's not the perfect match in, in, in four months. Um, so I would say to everybody, including myself, that even though they say that, give them a deadline and then move on to the next one. Even though you're happy that your first game is actually getting picked up because it hasn't been picked up until they actually sign the contract, right? Yeah, and that's, I suppose, uh, you know, I've sent a couple of games off to publishers and there was one that, um, that was actually in the contract that stated, you know, the, you know, I can contact other publishers. And I was like, okay. And nothing came from it at the end. And then I sent a game off to Haber because Haber were interested in one of the, the games I designed. And the pandemic came along two and a half years it took them to get back to me. Wow. Uh, and I had moved at that time and they'd sent the out to the wrong address, which was not their fault. Um, two and a half years, and I was waiting and waiting. But obviously, you know, the pandemic, you know, we, we limited, you know, there was obviously restrictions, um, which obviously, you know, puts a kind of a back burner and things. But you're absolutely right. They, having that restriction in place where you can only go to one publisher um, can be extremely frustrating. And then you've lost a, a lot of time out of your, your life where you could have uh, spent doing elsewhere, engaging with other publishers. But uh, yeah, th these are the things that hopefully others can uh, learn from and uh, gain some experience and knowledge behind and uh, be mindful of, of their you know, pitching to other publishers. Yeah, yeah. About the, the restrictions set from the publisher side, I had a few when at the fair where I usually present my games. Uh, because it's like a hop, right? Everybody's <laughs> at the same place. Uh, and then they say, uh, don't, uh, please don't show it to anybody else. Uh, until, uh, we really like this. But then you have to, like, again, uh, be cool and, and give them maybe six weeks or something like that. Uh, or maybe show it to other people even while you're at the fair and say, but well, there's a caveat, there's a, there's a reservation. So uh, you might not see the prototype for, for six weeks. Um, because again, you shouldn't let the publisher dictate it, but of course there is the common courtesy and, and give them, giving them six weeks is fine. I also heard some, even some publisher publishers, uh, sorry, some podcasters be very impatient and saying like, oh, I didn't hear anything for, for two weeks. And I think you have to, you have to be patient there because two weeks is actually nothing from, for a publisher, if they receive the game. I wouldn't expect them to get back to me in two weeks. I've never, never experienced that anyway. But like you said, two and a half years, that's too long, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just unfortunate the pandemic. To be fair, they, they were quite engaging, Haber. I have to, I have to be fair, they were, they were engaging. You know, we'll, we'll play it you know, when we can. I can imagine Haber is such a huge publisher. The amount of games they must get sent to them uh, would be quite obscene. So I can you know, imagine, you know, with, with COVID and all the other games there, testing, it's no surprise it took so long. It was frustrating, I have to say, you know, I think one point I waited, you know, four months for an email to be returned. And, you know, I understand there's things that get in the way, you know, and they, they've got other things to deal with. But yeah, something to be mindful of, don't expect, uh, like you say, a reply in two weeks, it's not gonna happen. Yeah. Um, great. So we'll move on to question number six then, Ollie. Okay. Dive in. I think the tough ones, uh, which is uh, not what I was expecting, but there we go. So, has there ever been a point you have felt board game designers were becoming too stale or unimaginative in their designs? Now, obviously, we wouldn't need any, but uh, do you feel this that uh, maybe? have been a few designers that are quite, I suppose, too static in their designs? Maybe, yeah, but I don't know if that's a problem because there are thousands of designers, right? And <laughs> thousands of games out there. Um, I, I, I think not any of it I can think of because sometimes you want a specific genre. It's like, like the, uh, the movie business is pretty obvious about this, right? They're, they're being... Uh, uh, accused of being very unoriginal in, in Hollywood on, on many points, right? But that's what the people want. And sometimes you want a specific type of game and you know they, they can deliver. deliver. I mean, uh, I'm going to name some games after all because they're very successful. But I mean, if you want a specific Carcassonne or, or Catan or, or a Ticket to Ride, I mean, you, you don't want them to change too much, right? Uh, you want the series to continue. So I think that's fine. I mean, you just, I mean, 
I don't know how loyal people are to specific designers. I'm not. <laughs> I, uh, I respect their work, but I'm, I mean, I look at the games first, and I suppose most people do that anyway. And then they have all kinds of games on their shelves. So I don't know if any that's too repetitive. I think I think the 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 board game uh, uh, public would would show them or tell them if they were by not buying their games. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. That's you can get some, I'm not, I'm not going to name, um, but there is um, a certain uh, couple of designers who use the same artist and that, you know, to me personally, it feels a little bit stale because I don't want to see the same art all the time. I want some differentiation in, in that artwork. Um, mm. And game design, yeah, th you're right. There's, there's thousands that get released each year um, and there's so much choice out there. So even if someone felt, you know, a certain design has been a bit stale in their design or it kind of se seems to feel the same from game to game, well, you look at some other games then if you're not happy with that. There's just so much choice out there. But um, I suppose, you know, that's all subjective and I'm sure that there's certainly people who are quite fond of certain designers and they, they follow them and they want to buy games and they will be su super enthusiastic when there's a new game coming out from them and you know because they think it's going to be the next great thing from them and you know that that's great to see that you know that that happens and you know because without people buying board games and we wouldn't have designers designing board games so but it's, it's also important to be innovative and try and evolve as as the industry grows but there is a risk and i've noticed that sometimes games can be quite over convoluted um, and sometimes the games that were perhaps kind of designed around 2010 to 2015 weren't overly convoluted. They're quite nicely kind of stripped back and streamlined. Whereas a lot of games that can be designed these days, because people are trying to find new ways, new mechanisms and slight tweaks, that sometimes it can become quite over convoluted. And certainly that's what I've experienced. I don't know if you've come across the same problem. Perhaps I'm just one of a few. Well, yeah, the the downside, of course, uh, of all those games being published is that yeah, you get the whole palette, right? You get uh, you get uh, some really weird ones, uh, and you get something that's really, really smooth. Uh, but the, so yeah, yeah, it's not e easy being a consumer <laughs> these days and find out. Uh, but at least the quality in general has been lifted immensely, right? Uh, at least oh, I like to think so. Oh yeah, the, the quality is stunning in some of these games. I mean, it's it's so amazing. You think, you know, when you compare it to 20 years ago, there's, there's no comparison. Um, you know, it was spoiled for choice, really. And it can only hopefully get better, but we'll, we'll see how the industry goes and uh, hopefully games will continue to go and get better and become innovative. Right, so let's move on to the next one and see how, uh, how we get on with this. So we have almost there. Big one of me. Okay, so are there any comments or assumptions that people make on social media about the industry which irks you, which annoys you? So, do you see any posts going about in Board Game Geek or Reddit that you think, oh, I don't quite agree with that? So, comments about the industry that annoys me? Um, <laughs> uh, I don't think anything comes to mind. Do you go on Boking Geek much or Reddit? Do you have a, have a look at look around? Yeah, but not the general discussion so much because there's usually a lot of me to do in the forums for uh, for my my games or the games I follow. I do see, of course, the whole uh, um, the whole uh, you know L key. What's it called? All all the the gender debate and, and discrimination and equality debates seeping into the board game industry. And that's, that's almost uh, disrupting, but it's also very interesting to see, like, I saw some people like uh, addressing covers on board game boxes. Like, it's like, what is that uh, white, white male dude? It's so generic. I, where's the, 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 the variety and where's the respect for that? That's, so that that has spawned some interesting discussions, um, but uh, nothing. I don't. Uh, nothing that annoys me. I mean, <laughs> I guess you move on because there's so much on the social media. So uh, yeah, and this, this is a point. 
is there, I suppose a lot plays with your culture and your background where you were you brought up. So um, being grown up in Scotland, certainly when I was growing up, you literally everyone was you know Caucasian white. That that uh, Scottish Caucasian white, and you have you know you 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 know shops where you have the uh, Pakistani culture and the the Chinese culture around as well, and. For me growing up, it's, you know, for me to see another culture was very, very unusual. It wasn't until I moved into London that I was like, whoa, okay, I didn't realise so, all these different cultures. Now, I now work in an industry uh, in senior disabilities, so I'm, I'm very used to working with different ethnic backgrounds and cultures and different abilities. And it just widens your, your viewpoint and actually it makes you realise when you, I suppose, when you're designing a game, you're more aware acute to what somebody may perceive as, as an issue if if you have a bunch of cars a deck building game and they're all Caucasian white people and there's no diverseness in the, in those cars of course that that's I mean very if you've got like a fantasy theme but it's it can be interesting in terms of how people can take it too far um, and be almost insulted by it but also it's important for designers to be aware of a potential issue and they might cause concern and upset people. So we'll see how it goes. And uh, but yeah, moving on, I'm sure people have their own viewpoints on that, and uh, we'll see what the comments are like down below. So I think we're on the eighth one, Ollie. And uh, so far, you've done fantastically well. And oh, this is so. This is an interesting one. I love this question, and uh, this is a fun one. So if you had the time machine. Is there a point in your life you would go back to and change? <laughs> uh, board game wise, yes, I would have gone back to before uh, Flashpoint Fire Rescue was published and had my own fire, firefighter game published. Because before I did my first published game, which was Police Precinct, I had made a firefighter game based on a dungeon crawler like Hero Quest and Descent and stuff like that, uh, which I thought was very fun. And I even had made three prototype copies and sent to a publisher, but they were too slow. And then uh, Flashpoint showed up, which was very annoying because it had some of the same points, not all the same, of course, but I mean, I didn't feel that the market was ready for two firefighters games so close to each other. So yeah, I would go back and, and beat him to the finish line. Uh, but uh, yeah. I, but then again, I might end up publishing this game or get this game published anyway at some point, I guess, uh, because it's a dungeon crawler and the Flashpoint isn't really a dungeon crawler. Um, I think it's more casual than that. Um, but uh, yeah, personally, I don't think that there's there's anything I would have changed. Maybe buy a, get a dog that doesn't bark so much. <laughs> but though. Yeah, it's a good it's a good point. I know I remember it was it Back to the Future who there was a that game came out as another very similar game, you know, Back to the Future that came out as well, exactly the same time. Um and it's almost it's, it's almost, you know, who can get the game out, you know, first uh, that tends to be the most successful. And there's a risk if you bring out a game that's almost identical to another game that's out in the market. So it can be extremely risky. Yes, and it's it's not so unusual, right? Lots of designs out there, uh, and and you think you you invent something original, and then that's a lot that looks like it. Uh, but I guess don't get intimidated. Continue with your uh, vision. That will be the the learning point, I think. Because yeah. the games turn out to be di quite different usually anyway once they actually yeah. get finished. Yeah, and it was, I think it was back to future days through time, and I think back to future. I can't remember through time or, or something similar. Um, and the, the games are very similar, but there was also enough differences as well to differentiate in terms of gameplay and some of the mechanisms. And it was just unfortunate they came out at exactly the same time. Um, it was very, very unusual uh, for that to happen. Um, but, it, you know, it did. And uh, they were actually both quite successful. One was more successful than the other, as, as you'd expect. But um, the other one did, did fine um, in the end. So uh, no hard feelings, I'm sure, between the designers. It's just unfortunate. <laughs> so um, yeah, let's move on to number nine. There we go. 
So what consideration should someone make when designing a board game? What 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 should they make? Sorry. What, what consideration? Somebody starting off, what should they consider when they're making a board game? What's the main, ah. main bit of advice you would give someone? One, once before they start or as they start a, a new design? Um Me either, I suppose you can you can take you can read that question how you like, answer it how you, how you mm. like. Um wow, well, yeah, that's I think uh get it get it tested not too late in the process. I've seen new designers that come with a game to our prototype nights uh very late in the process so they are very far with the design and they have only tested it on a very few people um and then there's might be some fundamental problems with the game or it's all, already overly complex um so i would say consider to get your games tested earlier and it doesn't matter actually too much if it's your friends testing or if it's professional designers because you need it's different feedback you get and you need all of it. I mean, you should ideally get feedback from both your your wife and your dog and your neighbor and your competitors and your your expert uh, peers. Um, so yeah, that, that will be the first one. Um, yeah, and then and then yeah, consider who's it for, right? I mean, it's easy uh, to design games for yourself, uh, but uh, make sure that there's actually a market for this. And of course, uh, um, consider if some, something too similar has been made. Like, like we talked about, thousands of games have been published every year, right? So uh, know, know you are a board game geek, <laughs> or at least do some research uh, to not waste too much time on something that's already out there. Um, or maybe to go in there and get some inspiration. Uh, don't be afraid to look at other games. <laughs> yeah. And a good point about play testing it as early as you can because you want to earn it. You want well, does it actually work? And I suppose what's important as well when you you know play testing with your friends and family is completely different than play, you know play testing with strangers because your family will be you know they'll tend to be really nice and uh, they won't be uh, well, it depends on your family. They might not be uh, too uh, honest with the feedback because it might not. Uh, hurt your feelings. So sometimes you need to actually grade it and go to a play testing group or find some strangers to play test that group and give some honest feedback. Uh, usually I, I, I have the opposite reaction actually because when I bring a game to my, my usual gaming group, which could have some, uh, my cousin is there among others and it's like, oh no, another of your <laughs> designs. I hate it already. <laughs> Can we play something that's finished? Well, it's all tongue in cheek, but yeah. They're not treating me. They're not treating it extra nice just because it's one of my designs. Guess you get that once you've made more than one game. <laughs> <laughs> they can be rough, um, but yeah, I think uh, what one we when while we're touching on the the, the test part, uh, also coming from the QA business myself, um, be very observant of your testers and what you're asking for them and what they're telling you. Um, I one of the latest things I've, I've I've, I've pondered about is that, or, or, or noticed is that people tend to get very upset if the game is unbalanced. That's actually usually pretty easy to fix. Fix. It's not a structural problem, right? It's a tweaking problem. Maybe some numbers are wrong, but you will hear a lot about it if it's unbalanced and the red player has fewer resources than the yellow player. Uh, then they're going to be very upset and the game sucks. <laughs> That's usually what you get from of course, less professional testers, but you have to sort through all that. Also, often you get you get feedback that are solutions to problems, while you should sort through it and hear what the problem is, right? Because as a designer, you should focus on the problem, not their suggestion to fix it. But sometimes they don't mention the problem, they just give you a solution. Um, and you have to think, why did they suggest this weird thing? Um, maybe it comes from a very valid, or often it comes from a very valid uh, point of critique and you have to find that point and see how you want to fix it yeah absolutely and yeah play, play testing is vital isn't it i know J jenny uh, stone i you know girls they're sending to people on his channel it's so important you've got to play test you've got to get the feedback 
and try and fix the, the bugs and the issues that are in that game to try and put it right. And play test, play test, you know, that's, that's what's going to help you get the game right. And, uh, you know, you've had first hand experience of that. So we're on to our final question, Owen. So are we ready for the, the last one? Yes. Let's, let's see, because you've had tough ones, let's see if we get some fluffy ones. There are a few uh, really nice fluffy ones here. We are finding some. Let's see if we can get one. Maybe not, we'll see. Okay. Right. Oh, well. <laughs> What has been the proudest moment for you in the board game industry? It's a nice one to finish with. <laughs> the proudest moment? The proudest. The, 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 the thing you're, you're the most proudest about. What's the, what's the biggest, proudest moment? <laughs> yeah, that's that's funny. Of course, getting. I mean, you know, I was very proud to get my first game published. But I think it's it's probably when Will Wheaton brought brought uh, Jameson Midgard on his uh, YouTube show, right? Uh, what was it called? Uh, was it just called, oh, I can't even re remember the name, but uh, it's just embarrassing. But uh, <laughs> he had this uh, board game TV show where he played with celebrities and they played Champions of Midgard. So they dedicated an entire episode praising the game and playing it through. I mean, uh, to get Hollywood celebrities playing a game is, is something you could be pretty proud about oh well, absolutely much bigger than that can you it's uh you ask the you but slightly is uh you know boasting about it that's that's yeah that's amazing i mean i'm sure many designers would love to, to see that happen with their game I think, yeah i think it was called tabletop yeah, now that i remember that's right that's yeah so. it was yeah and, and uh, i think it was the last one they did where it was open to the pop oh it was uh not hidden behind the payment wall and he was the host himself and so on so we were very lucky that it was it was the grand finale <laughs> the champs of midgard uh when yeah, well, it sort of well, reached a lot of people i'm sure people can uh yeah they can put that in the youtube search and it should pop up and they can uh, have a watch of that it's uh yeah it's definitely a proud moment yeah and it's it's quite entertaining i, I was already a fan of his show that's of course also why I, I was so proud of being part of it all of a sudden, but uh, well, I was not on the show, but my game was. So, yeah, it's a good show. It was a good show. Well, well, yeah, let's check it out, definitely. So that brings us to the end, Ollie. I hope you've enjoyed this. And, yeah, uh, it was fun. I hope I didn't flunk. <laughs> you've been a great guest, and uh, it's been absolutely amazing to hear some insight as well into the industry and what it's like being a game designer, I'm sure others will find that valuable. Thank you. It was, it's been a pleasure. Uh, so that brings us to the end. If you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to the channel and please give this video a like and let us know in the comments down below. Any particular highlights from today's show that you liked and yeah, perhaps there's some questions you'd like us to ask guests in the future. If you have any suggestions, please leave them in the comments down below. Then that brings us to the end. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, take care. Thank you.